Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Fairleigh Dickinson University's UN Pathways Lecture Series. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2008-2009 series of the Pathways Lectures. Uh, for those of you who have attended Pathways Lectures before, you will know that we are uh, strict but fair here. We invite uh, a guest of eminence and magnitude and wisdom. Uh, we present uh, that guest in favorable circumstances and then grill them mercilessly uh, within an inch of their existence. Uh, tonight, we are very pleased to have as our guest uh, His Excellency uh, Fernando Valenzuela, uh, permanent representative of the delegation of the European Union. Our conversation will be moderated by His Excellency Ambassador Ahmad Kamal, uh, who you will know from such um, activities as last year's UN Pathways series. Um, Ambassador Kamal uh, has served as permanent representative uh, to the UN from Pakistan, also as Foreign Minister of Pakistan. He presently serves as President of the Ambassadors Club of the United Nations, uh, and we are uh, delighted and humbled uh, by his service on Fairleigh Dickinson University's Board of Trustees. There are a few uh, business-type announcements that I've been asked to make. Uh, first of all, um, this program will be recorded. Uh, so I ask that you silence your telephones and other accessories. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank uh, the Office of Global Learning uh, student staff, Caitlin Taylor and Jackie Human, for all of their assistance in organizing tonight's event, uh, which is uh, magnificently uh, attended. Uh, I would like also uh, to acknowledge uh, and welcome our guests from off campus, including members of the Morris County Chamber of Commerce and guests from the North Jersey Media Group. Um, tonight's conversation uh, is titled Problems and Prospects, uh, the European Union Problems and Prospects. Uh, I hope that we will find out uh, if problems and prospects are uh, concerning old Europe, uh, whether they are concerning new Europe, or whether they are concerning uh, a Europe perhaps that we are not even as yet uh, acquainted with. Uh, so with no further ado, I will turn proceedings over to Ambassador Kamal. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's obvious that uh, this distinguished audience has no interest in the presidential debate, uh, which is why they've decided to come and spend the evening here. <clears throat> so I admire your sense of priorities at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson. Uh, but that being said, it's a great pleasure to have Ambassador Valenzuela here with us. Uh, all of you have seen uh, his curriculum vitae, and so you know the background of the man. What I can tell you is that I've had the opportunity of serving with him uh, in Geneva, where he was a fearsome ambassador. We learned to respect him. Uh, because he was a very solid ambassador with strong opinions, and it was not easy to stand in front of him in an argument. And so, uh, then now that he is with the European uh, Union in the European Commission, uh, I knew him in other incarnations, and he knew me also as just as an ambassador what he did not know, and he, I, he does not know this until now, that I have also been accredited to the European Union in the 1960s when it was in a previous incarnation of what was in those days called the European Economic Community. And so there is some familiarity that I have with the development of the European Union, perhaps a bit longer than his own uh, knowledge of the European Union, and so I warned him to wear a bulletproof vest tonight. Uh, and I see that he has <laughs> followed that instruction. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation between the two of us, <clears throat> and then we will open it up to Q&A from uh, the audience. So please feel free, uh, once we open the questions and answers, to catch my eye. Let me start, Ambassador Valenzuela, by asking you to give us a bit of the background of the European Union 
as I understand the European Union, it was the result of a conspiracy by France to try to get hold of German militarism. And the way that the French thought it through was to get hold of German strength, which lay in coal and steel, and to somehow hijack German coal and steel and put it under a European umbrella. And once that experiment worked in the early 1950s, it was only natural to try to expand it into a European, a wider European context of originally six countries. Am I right in my interpretation that the basic uh, raison d'etre of the European Union was a desire to control Germany and to prevent it from ever doing what it had already done twice, which is to initiate two world wars starting in Europe. Is Germany the focal point of the European Union? Thank you, and let me just uh, say a word to thank you and thank uh, Fellow Dickinson University for inviting me to be with you today, um, this evening. Uh, but I'm going to go into, into your question. I think I'm going to take a kind of more amiable at, uh, approach to this construction of Europe. But I think there is something fundamentally true in what you say, is that after two world wars, in fact, if you count the Franco-Prussian War of 1870s, uh, three wars between France and Germany in 60, 70 years was more than enough, particularly considering that each one of them was worse than the previous one, more catastrophic, more destructive, uh, causing more human suffering. So clearly, there was an idea of having to change things, having to change the dynamics of Europe. And um, this idea came together with an old idea that has always also existed in Europe from the times of Charlemagne, which is the sense of unity, the sense that Europe should be united. Uh, in some way, somehow, because we all belong to the same uh, culture, we all share the same set of values, etc. So this uh, old idea of unity on the one hand and the need to find new ways of uh, coexistence in Europe uh, to avoid a new war uh, among European countries, or as indeed it was in the last two cases, world war, uh, uh, wars, uh, this idea of creating interests that would share, that would be shared, came to life. And basically, the first one to put it in, in, in a political proposal was uh, Schumann, who is considered one of the fathers of the European Union. And he proposed precisely to create the coal and steel community, which, in other words, meant to bring the coal and steel productions of France and Germany also of Luxembourg, Belgium, and, and Netherlands, but basically France and Germany together under the authority of a supranational uh, body that was the steel and coal community, uh, and outside of the control of the states. And that was the seed of what has become the European Union. The idea, basic idea was on the one hand, coal and steel at that time were the two main elements of the power of a country, and also the main two elements for war. Uh, to detract that from the sovereignty of the states and put it under a neutral authority was a way to prevent uh, uh, further wars. But at the same time, the idea of what has been called functionalism, which is, is you create a sense of unity by working together on common issues. And working together in common issues creates common interests, and if you have this uh, shared interests, then normally you don't go to war, on the contrary. That creates a dynamic that develops further and further. That, that's exactly what has happened in the EU, something that started with that very precise uh, objective,